My name is Stanley Sword and I have the pleasure to sit here with David Kiselius. Welcome to an, a talk about life, passion, inspiration and motivation. You're an esteemed cancer researcher and, uh, and you're a professor here in Lund in cancer and you're developing the field uh, every day and every night when you go to sleep you, you're working with your mind and when you come here you work with your body and mind. Tell me about your, your latest uh, discoveries. So I, I work on how cancer develops within the patient. So cancer cells don't stand still from a genetical point of view. Instead they tend to change their genome every fifth or every tenth cell division. Mm. Which means that even if a, the mother of let's say 10,000 cancer cells, if they share a common origin or a common mother cell that might, might look in a certain way. It might have one or two mutations. Maybe the daughter cells will look different or maybe they will look quite the same and this may vary from cancer to cancer. What we are trying to see is that is which cancers vary from cell to cell in their genotype or in how their chromosomes look mm. and which ones do not. And do these differ clinically? And what we have seen over the past 15 years when I have been actually working, this is quite amazing, I finished my thesis 15 years ago mm. and I've been working on this more or less, yeah. uh, not full time but always part time since then and uh, then uh, we didn't know anything and about if cancer cells differ from each other genetically mm. and how and why. Now we know pr pretty much how they mm. do it um, but we still, it's still quite unclear if this means, what this means to the patient. What we know is that if the cancer is very flexible and the cancer genome can change from cell division to cell division, which gives the different cancer cells within a tumor different properties, those cancers are more difficult to cure. These mm. are the typical pancreatic cancers or lung cancers and so on. And then there are other ones that change very little such as slow-growing leukemias, mm. uh, where you can actually keep it down with a single drug. And when you go on with strong drugs, you kill almost all the cancer cells, mm. but then the, the fitter survive, the strongest yeah. cancer cells, mm. and they start to bloom sometimes. This is what can happen, and this is kind of, kind of almost a standard scenario when a, a cancer patient dies from mm. a disease. Mm. It's usually um, from a cancer, uh, where there are different types of cancer cells within a tumor. And you can knock down most of them with the first treatment that you give, but then the cancer cells grow back mm. and come back after a while and, and kill the patient. And that's what you're working with, with now. Yes. And, and you also said it's, there's you know, different fields and different ways to, mm. to look at this disease. Mm. There's, an, there's a fairly new science about strengthening the immune system mm -hmm. and working with the health instead of the sickness perhaps. Mm -hmm. Tell me a bit about that. So it's, a, it's, a, it's not my field actually. I just work with it to, as a doctor to some extent, helping out with those studies. But what is being done is basically that what you, you, is you take away the cancer cells' <coughs> weapons that they use to disguise themselves from the immune system. So you use drugs that target those mechanisms. So instead of the cancer cell saying, hello, I'm your friend, <laughs> how it tricks the immune cells, yeah. it takes away those nice arms that wave and say, hello, I'm your friend, knocks them out, takes them away, uh, and uh, then the immune system can actually recognize the cancer for what it is, something which is part self, mm. part foreign, mm. part friend in a way, it has been a friend itself, part your enemy, mm. exaggeratingly becoming your enemy as time goes by. And here in Lund, you're, you're running a research lab, uh, a really stronghold in the world because you're working with, with a fairly rare disease, mm -hmm. thanks God, mm -hmm. cancer. In children, yes. Yeah. yeah. So tell me about what's, what's your lab here in Lund, what makes you unique in the world? I think what makes us unique here is that we have a very strong integration and collaboration between the clinical departments where we work with the patients and the patient samples and uh, make diagnosis of cancer and the research part. Mm -hmm. And also Lund is quite unique in the sense that we have a long tradition of following childhood cancer patients long into adulthood. Mm -hmm. 
So here in Lund, some of the first studies, this is before I was born, were made where they decided to actually follow kids that survived their cancer when they were small mm. uh, and see what type of, what late effects were there in life from the cancer and from the different treatments. Mm. Because of course, maybe we find a new and fantastic drug that could kill, that, that could cure even more kids with cancer. But mm. if this drug uh, is debilitating when you become 15 or 20 or 25 or even 30, that's of course a poor choice still with yeah. this drug if it kind of destroys your life later. And uh, we're sitting here with a, with a colleague of yours. Uh, and that was a former colleague of mine, yeah. Exactly, and that what happens when, when we pass away. And we think that, you know, cancer is a way to pass away. But, but since the 70s until now, mm. there's been a revolution in the, mm. in the survival statistics of kids in cancer. Yeah. Tell me about these numbers. Yeah, the numbers are, are basically that in the, I mean, in, the, in the early 60s, almost everyone died. And yeah. now all, very many, most of the kids actually make it and survive. That's just amazing yeah. So we're Statistics. Ra- coming up to around 80% overall survival for childhood cancer, or even higher in certain centers. And in your lifetime, how far will you be able to push that 80%? Is it up to 85 or 95%? Yeah, I, think we, I, I, I personally think that if, if the society can be maintained as it is, where we actually can afford treatments, and the research is maintained as it is, that we're actually allowed to develop new treatments, and uh, then I think we will pass the 90%. Mm-hmm. limit absolutely and pushing and we can never for any disease we, we know this we cannot reach a hundred percent unless we get rid of the disease altogether like with a small pox for instance it's mm-hmm. just been gone because mm-hmm. of vaccination uh, then of course you can reduce lethality completely yeah but as long as the disease exists i mean even <sighs> Even just a common cold can, in a weak person, give them bacterial pneumonia, and then especially they actually die from the cold. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Me especially. I'm... And and what do you think of the the future? Do you see, do you look with bright eyes towards the future? Because the the, the cancer, as we feel it, you know, as the common Joe, has been increasing a lot. Almost someone knows someone who who, who got cancer. Mm. But you said to me earlier that it's it's because we're getting older, mm. and it's because we do more research. We find the cancer patients earlier as well. Mm. So tell me about a bit about that. Did it, you know, when we were living in in stone caves, was the statistics? <laughs> yeah, same exactly. Then? We discussed that. No, and the thing is that no one knows because there is the study population is too small. So what you are left with then are mummified remains, yeah, or uh, fossils. Yeah. fossilized bones, where you can actually, in some cases, see ca- cancer cells that have metastasized to the skeleton. Mm. And in the mummies, of course, where you still have some soft organs preserved, you can see more. But typically, it's, uh, it's metastases to the bone. Mm. And there are even actually dinosaur fossils mm. where you can see tumors oh. uh, that have become ossified, mm. bony. And you can still see... How, how that tumor grew in the dinosaur yeah. long time ago. So cancer has always been with us. Cancer exists with all multicellular, almost all multicellular organisms. But if it was more common in those days, I mean 2,000 years ago, or if it was more rare, we do not know this at all because there are just too few remains mm-hmm. to make any viable statistics. And when you look into the body as a researcher in the microscope, mm-hmm. is there any parallels with looking out to the universe? Oh, sure. It's, it's the inner universe and we yeah. can explore it as long as it's... I mean, you can go as far as you... You, can, you cannot reach the end of space. Mm. And I think in the same way, you can never reach the very end of knowledge when it comes to the human body. Mm. If you can ever do that in any field. Mm. I do not know. So it's... Uh, and is it like... Because you, you increased uh, the cancer cells and they were in different colors and shapes and so on. Mm. It looked like supernovas. Is there any visual similarities between the outer space and the inner space? It depends on which techniques you use. But what we, of course, similar, the astronomers, the astronomers, most of the, I mean, classical astronomy, then you have your telescope and you work with light mm. from foreign bodies in, in space, far off. Mm. Uh, and uh, to uh, see through human tissues and cells, we also use light mm. in various ways. You can use it just 
ordinary light, like we sit in here, visible light. Uh, or you can use fluorescent lights in many ways, making uh, different parts of the cells light up in, in this fluorescent, beautiful colors. Yeah. And uh, then you have to decide what part of the cell should be colored how. And those pictures, actually, they look quite a lot like pictures of space. Mm. Actually, and Sometimes when an untrained eye sees this, they say, is this a, <laughs> is this a supernova? No, it's a chromosome. Yeah. So yeah. And the passion of yours is free diving, going into the depths of Skjellriken and other seas. And when you go into that darkness mm -hmm. and, and that light, uh, what's the similarities there when you're in flow at work? Mm, no, it's like exploring something that hopefully no one has ever seen before. Mm. It's a fantastic magical feeling when you're with your eyes, because I work a lot with imagery also in science, that you see something that has not ever been seen before and find new horizons and new worlds. It's, mm. it's like going down uh, five, ten meters into the, the sea and mm. uh, finding this little crevice in the cliffs with the animals that I have, since I'm not a marine biologist, and I haven't been doing mm. much to go diving either, either just a little, a few years ago. It's animals I've never seen before and plants that I didn't know exist. And it's quite fascinating. Mm. So there's a, there's a new world underneath the water, there's a new world within us, and there's a new world out there. Is our lives too short to you know, be able to discover and develop all of that? I mean, we're, we're here for blink of an eye a yeah. hundred years or so yeah. uh, do you feel that your your time is limited or do you feel endless possibilities no i uh, i work with death so for me every last every day could be the last day yeah. uh, but there is a new generation there yeah. are always other people and no people every single individual is unique but we can all be replaced in many ways mm. And I have no, I, I don't have the faintest idea that someone else couldn't do my job as well as I do it. Mm. Uh, so, as a father, I'm not replaceable, but as a scientist, I think I'm highly replaceable, actually. Mm. And, and uh, you lost your mother last year. A year, year. ago, yeah. yeah. Actually, it's yeah. quite exactly a year ago, mm. uh, in a few days. Mm. Yeah. In cancer that was developed very quickly and fast. Uh, how is it to... to experience you know the the, the 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 trauma so close that you've been looking mm. at at far for so long mm. is it have, have it has it been easier or harder you think to 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 uh, work with this with the feelings and the, and the, and the loss and, and and the sickness that came in yeah. your family it's for me it's the I can't give you a scientific answer because there's kind of I don't have a control group it's just me and I've been in yeah. biomedicine since I was 18 uh, but uh, f I think still that uh, it is easier to handle this if uh, you have some knowledge at first hand of what is going on mm. because it it, uh, it makes certain things uh, which very very certain and clear that is not clear to the the non-professional, mm. the very, you know a lot more from, from early on. So, mm. and that also means that in many ways it just changes the, the dynamics over time on how you cope with it. Mm. So, it's clear that if you know a lot about cancer and one of your relatives gets come in a present with cancer in a situation with massive spread of the tumor, mm. like my mother actually did. Mm then you know from first hand that this can never be cured mm. unless it's a very specific and rare type of tumor. Mm. So you basically know from day one, this is going to kill her. Mm. And of course, this is, the, this is not, the oncologist wouldn't say this to a patient because one in the 10,000 patients might actually make it and then they have lied and they don't want to take the hope away no. from the patient. That is, and that is very good, of course. This is kind of their, their way of taking care of patients. Yeah. So they, they would never say this to her. And I wouldn't say it to her either because mm. I didn't want to take away her hope. But mm. you know, for me, it was obvious. Mm. And, uh, and do you have any advice for, for relatives that, that have kids or... or, or you know, loved ones affected by cancer? Mm. First of all, if you, first of all, is to ad advise to other medical professionals is that it, the, in such situation one has, one shouldn't try to be the professional. Mm. So, you, ha you might have certain knowledge that could help you or make it kind of 
in the beginning at least, when you realize a lot more than other people, make it kind of, you, you take a lot of the shock. You, you get it very fast in the beginning, and then it's less. Oh. Yeah. So it's, you get all the shock to start with. That's what, what I mean by different dynamics. Yeah. That you get unpleasant realizations at an early point. And then it's not, and then you kind of get used to this, and then you cope with it later mm. on. But for others, it could be more going up and down along the way. Mm. No, but my first advice is that always try to be a non-professional. When it's your mother, or it's your daughter, or it's your brother, or if it's your best friend, or if it's your spouse, uh, you should be exactly that. You shouldn't be the doctor. Mm. And so, so never try to navigate the healthcare system through, at least here in Sweden, it's very, it doesn't really serve your sick relative well if you try to navigate it through your own channels. You should behave as any other patient uh, or any other relative and be there mm. for your family as a mm. part of the family. Mm. Of course, then you can help explaining things. But uh, it's uh, trying to sort it out on your own. It's a very, for, okay, for very banal things, that's just fine. But for anything that could be serious, that is just a bad idea. Yeah. I was taught this by an, uh, one of my old mentors, an old professor of clinical chemistry here in Lund, who's a very wise man, mm. Peter Nilsson Ehle, a mm. great medical chemist and a great teacher. And mm. he, always, he taught me this from a young age at medical school, that one, when you yourself become sick, or your relatives become sick, you have to immediately stop being the doctor and mm. act as the relative. Mm. Don't try anything else, it will go wrong. And then he had a number of examples how this could go wrong, and he was so right. And I yeah. personally l met several patients who have been doctors themselves, where things have gone completely over the table, because uh -huh. they have not acted as patients uh -huh. early enough. And it's very difficult. I'm healthy, so I couldn't tell what I would do. Uh -huh. But as a relative now, I know that I can take a step back and be a relative and, and, and not a, as, a doctor. As a regular father or mother, what more advice can you, can you give when your loved one is, 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 is affected by the disease? What, what should you do as a father or mother when you have a kid that's struck with cancer? It's, um, I can't give better advice than you, I think, mm. uh, in this sense. One just has to be there for them. And it depends on so much on how the family works yeah. and how the family dynamics is and what your role is in the family. Yeah. That's, uh, but one has to be there, and that's important, of course. Yeah. It's not trivial. But, but show love instead of be a Ex seeming exactly. doctor. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh -huh. yeah. And young people today who want to become a doctor, mm -hmm. what's the three best advice you could give them? Make, yeah, one, three best advice, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, advice number one is to make, be sure that you have the right motives. Yeah. Um, by that Mo I mean Money, to... power. Exactly. <laughs> no, uh, t because you, you really want to make sure that it's a job that suits you, that you really get, that you really feel pleasure in, in that role mm. as someone who gives advice and helps out. Mm. Uh, because then I think you will enjoy it the most. Yeah. And you have to have it. That's the first thing. So make sure that you want to actually work in some context where you actually work with living human beings. Mm. Then you become, can become a laboratory physician or you can be in the ER and meet a lot of live patients. But you still have to be interested in the human context and the mm. human situation, not only the technicalities of medicine. Then there are plenty of space in research, for instance, for people only interested in the technicalities. Mm. It's a waste of space, I would say. To, mm. You get a much better training that you can do much, do a lot better for humankind by training in other fields and then go into medicine from that point of view. Uh -huh. it's, uh, second is, uh, is that you still have to have a genuine scientific interest, otherwise you will become a poor doctor. Uh -huh. I mean, all medicine is based on experience, documented experience and on science. That's mm. it. And you have to respect that and one has to be a dedicated learner. Mm. So it's... Uh, so, and so it's, uh, you should have a true interest, I think, in, in bi biomedical science. It can't just be a medicine man anymore. No, but they also Dancing had, I around. think, what they thought were documented traditions, mm. in a way. So it's kind of similar, but they didn't have the experimental science. Mm. That's the reason we are so much stronger now than, than they were in ancient days, is that yeah. we have 
this experimental, the empirical science that we actually do experiments. Mm. And that helps us save life mm. in the end. And the third advice? And the third is to be yourself. Uh, you shouldn't choose what doctor to become according to what your parents thought you should become as a doctor or what your friends say or what uh, is, has the highest status. Mm. Uh, you should choose according to what suits you as a personality. Mm. And the sooner you find out what suits you, the better. And how do you find out what you aim to be in life? I guess you have to, uh, you have to try. I think both you and me would agree that one has to try a number of things mm. and, uh, and then see what fits. Mm. So, so, but some people, they just know intuitively. Mm. And your father was dentist. Yes, this is correct. Yeah. And uh, there's a bit competition, a father and a son. Yeah. And you were competing to... to uh, take the place he didn't take in, in medicine school yeah tell me tell me tell me about how is it to grow up in a in a in that tradition because if you grow up when and your parents is industrial workers mm. it's you have perhaps less chance of becoming mm. a doctor or... actually yeah it's interesting to what what is meant by an academic environment M many people here in lund like me grow up in with parents who have academic training both my parents had um and uh, people think that people might think that this entails a lot of like learning by parents and that the parents actually discuss academic matters with you mm. my father never did that uh, my mother did it occasionally not mm. very often the, it's a difference of your expectations i think first of all you're in a social environment that that provides good schools mm. and good teachers and those are and, and good friends the friends are the best teachers the second best are the good teachers in school i think mm. but it's the expectation that uh, it's natural there are no limits it's natural to go to uh, to to uh, pursue higher education mm and get a university degree, because so many people have done it before you in the family. Yeah. So it does, you don't think twice about it, you just do it if you feel like it. Then you have to, on the other hand, if you have other talents, then you have to think twice about becoming something else, which can be poor, actually. Mm. It could be a, a problem. And as a father now yourself, mm -hmm. how do you pass on the torch? Because you can't inherit the doctor's title. No, and I'm not sure that it suits my daughters. I have two daughters and uh, that uh, I'm not at all sure that uh, they are the type that would like to uh, do what I do. Mm. And sometimes I, I drag them along to work because yeah. I have like emergency <laughs> cases to, uh, to handle not, yeah. uh, in the lab and uh, they hate it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, my oldest daughter once, uh, was, uh, when we only had her, I, I dragged her, I, I got a phone call, I had to go to the, where we received fresh uh, surgical specimens to take care of a yeah. fresh childhood tumor that we had to do diff various things with to, to make sure we got the right diagnosis. And I had to put, so she was three, and I put her in a room with crayons along uh, somewhere else, because uh, I was going to cut through this huge thing, yeah. <laughs> and there would be, it would be quite messy. And then it turned out that the patient had a... a, a it was uh, they thought the patient had contracted a, an infectious disease as well. Mm. So it means that we had to dress up in this biohazard equipment. Yeah. And then, so when I once <laughs> had dressed up, I decided I should go check on her before I kind of got blood stained all over. Yeah. <laughs> so I went check on her, and she got so frightened because I showed up in this biohazard yeah. suit with these visors and everything. Yeah. And since then, she just hates the place. <laughs> yeah. And today we had lunch with your lovely wife. Yeah. She's also in this field of cancer. Yeah, and she's a true researcher. So I'm a part-time clinician. Yeah. And she's a full-time researcher. How is it to, to you know, have, have the same, not exactly the same occupations, but mm. in the same field? Is it enriching or is it boring? No, it, it's never boring. Mm. But you cannot, the problem is that you cannot get any... Uh, <laughs> What should I say? It's, you, can never, you can never trick her saying that you have to. And now I have to do this on my own and uh, dedicate two hours here this evening. Or you have to take care of the kids, yeah. blah, 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 because I have to do this. Because her, what she does when she has that, it's just as important as for me. And then she said, no, but I don't have to do that. Why yeah. should you? Yeah. So there are kind of zero, you, zero benefits there yeah. from a professional position because it's all the same. Yeah. So that's for the individual. <laughs> it might be bad, but I think for the family it's quite good because we, it turns out that we spend much more time with each other that way because there's kind of no excuse not to be together. Yeah. 
there's a lot of because you can bury yourself as a professor. You're a young professor. Yeah, you and became, you can always do more. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you can spend, you can pour in a hundred hours a week, and it's not sufficient. Anyway. No, you can, there is kind of no limit. Uh, how, you how much never finish. I mean, we, as long as, as I said, totally before, as long as uh, there's kind of no limit to the work, because as long as kids die from cancer, we are still in the business. Yeah. And we can never rest, really. And, and your career, you, you, you came out as an early doctor. You, you went into, into the school right away. Uh, yeah, exactly. Because I have merely, I, I'm so old that there yeah. was still <laughs> quite, too, most boys went to military service. I yeah. was one of them. Like, I think we were, uh, turned out to be around 50% in the end. Mm -hmm. But the feeling was still, yeah, one went. And, uh, and uh, that meant that there was kind of uh, still a, a kind of a leave one year coming up later. And uh, you never know with that old system, once you got into medical school one year, you wasn't sure that maybe there would be a lottery next year because there would be too many applicants with high mm -hmm. grades. So you better get in and take your place mm -hmm. if you wanted to become a doctor when the place was really there. You, couldn't, you didn't die waiting. Yeah. Uh, so I went in, I applied right after high school and I got in and then I, I spent two years there and uh, the, I was very disillusioned in the beginning actually because I came from an extremely stimulating environment in high school. Oh. Uh, many friends that were very dedicated to, uh, to their studies and to anything which was intellectual and fun. Oh. Studies was just part of it. So we had a lot of fun. It was very stimulating and then medical school was kind of... Uh, no, <laughs> I didn't keep the level, I would say. It uh. was uh, not very challenging. It was a lot of rote, what you call rote learning. You learn things by heart. You don't have to think so much about it. And, uh, and compared to the high school teachers I had, they, the teachers were not very good. Mm. Because there is still, actually, not the same expertise in teaching mm. in, uh, at, at a university, usually, in Sweden. It's different from the US, a big difference, for instance, but than you will find in, in very good high schools, yeah. amazingly, but that's yeah. how it is. Because what you really get credits for in this nat world of natural sciences is your research, and teaching all tends to come secondary. Mm. So extremely qualified teachers don't get promoted. Anyhow, uh, so I got, I got bored. Yeah. And then I had actually had a very good teacher, for a short lecture in clinical genetics. A man called Ulf Christoffersson, who is still working here as a doctor. And uh, he was so inspiring that I decided that this, this, this is really cool. And he yeah. said, if you have nothing to do in the summer, come and talk to me and we might, there, there might be projects, he just said. So I went there. And uh, yes, there, if I, he said that, well, uh, if you come here, a few times a week on a spare time and do this project first yeah. for free, <laughs> then there might be a stipend for you for the summer of next year. It sounds like Karate Kid. Yeah, yeah, it was, you know. Yeah, and then you had to learn to recognize all the chromosomes by your eyes. Yeah. And that was my first introduction to this, what we, is now call, what we call morphology. It means to, to deduce intellectual conclusions of what you see with your eyes. This mm. is the science of morphology, to look in the microscope typically mm. of things. Mm. in cells and understand what they are, classify them and mm. understand what's going on. Mm. So this is how I got into morphology, which I had no clue was even existed. I mm. started looking at chromosomes. Mm. And uh, then by a uh, long road, I ended up in pathology, which was a field when I was in medical school I would never touch. Oh. I thought it was super boring. It was very traditional in those days. Oh. It was, again, a lot of rote learning, no mechanism, just classification and hideously... <laughs> unstimulating yeah. and no live patients. I would no. say, I will never do this. They don't talk back. No, they don't talk back, exactly. And then you uh, went out in the real world. Exactly, school. yeah. Tell me about the real world. Uh, you mean the, for the <laughs> real world was, was probably in a way military service because then I got uh, to meet so many people who did not come from academia. Yeah. And that was actually a completely invaluable experience. Mm. Yeah, I would never, ever uh, not do it again. Uh, and, and, and then you went to the States? Yeah, for a, a kind of fairly brief period, actually. Mm. Uh, so, uh, How was the culture and environment there compared to here in Sweden? It, it was f friendly, but it, I think it has become very friendly. Sweden, Swedes are not so afraid of foreigners anymore as they were when I was a kid. Mm. Um, but it was friendlier, and, uh, but also more competitive. Mm. Uh, but I was at Harvard, which is a competitive place. Mm -hmm. 
But as, as if you can, if you came there young, foreign, and hardworking, you were always welcome, and I yeah. had a very good time. Yeah. And I learned a lot there. But that is actually why I decided to become a my first step towards, in the end, still deciding to become a pathologist because I did a summer school there in in pathology, and that that where the tea and there at Harvard the teaching had a completely different qualities than here. Yeah. And I realized what pathology was actually for, and that was super important for patients and for, mm. for the healthcare. You work with the dead in order to keep the alive people alive. In a way, yeah, but we mostly actually work with, with people mm. who are alive. Yeah. Where we just look at, speci look at tissue specimens yeah. in the microscope or l take them apart. When you have operated a tumor, for instance, we cut it up and see what, what type of tumor is this. You have an extremely important work because you you get samples from live patients and it's your job to tell whether it's a lethal cancer or whether it's not exactly whether, and then the, the the surgeons base their decisions on, on your mm. so your it's uh, that's why pathologists are important yeah. first uh, because uh, it's still, even though we have a lot of high-tech science, ama amazingly, most diagnosis of cancer, for instance, is still made by just a tissue sample and uh, that is prepared in a tra very traditional way and put in a light microscope. And then it's up to the, the lady or the man who mm. looks at that uh, to have in enough expertise to say what it is. And what's the, what's the, what's the three best things of you know, your job? No routine. It's absolutely always intellectual stimulation. So I work with pathology in children, and most diseases in kids are rare. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of them, but each and every one of them is quite rare. So it means that there is like no single two or three disease types that would dominate a day of mine. Mm -hmm. If I have 10, if, if I had 10, if I, let's say that I, that I would look at 10 patients in my microscope, most commonly, those 10 kids have 10 different diseases. Yeah. And that's a huge difference, actually, from many other fields where you work as a doctor. Yeah. So that is extremely stimulating. So the, the diversity and the, the continuous intellectual challenge, because odds are also that at least two of those diseases I have never seen before. So uh -huh. I have to go to the scientific literature to make sure that I put the correct diagnosis. And typically I also ask, of course, in those cases, I, I discuss it with my colleagues yeah. who are older than me. Yeah. Uh, so var variation is fantastic and, uh, and challenging. That's kind of the same thing. Uh, freedom. I'm not. Uh, I'm scared in, in the clinics. I'm scheduled, but it still typically means that I can choose when I do m most of the things I do because it's intellectual wo intellectual work with your microscope and your computer. Uh, so you can. So if the kids are sick, for instance. And me and my wife, we, we meticulously share how much time we spend with the kids when they are sick. Usually they are not sick, which is good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very rarely sick. But if they happen to be sick, then you can actually be home with them in the day. And then you can go back home in the evening. And then you spend like several hours there in front of the microscope. And then you can still keep up with your patient load. Mm. And this, so freedom is, is very, it's fantastic in mm. that sense. So that, and the third thing is that you never ever have to question that what you do matters. No. Which is not always the case, actually. I, I mean, I worked as a Swedish medic. If you go through the Swedish medical training system, it, it means that you have to practice diff many different s specialties of medicine mm. during your internship and as a clinical student. You have to be in all the different departments. Mm. And sometimes you do actually wonder, mm. why do I have to do Why do I do this? Does the, will this benefit the patient? Will... Uh, Will uh, this paperwork, why do I have to fill in all this paperwork? Why do I have to document all these things? Because it's, someone has said that one should do it, but there is no rationale for this. Mm. And what led up to you becoming such a young professor? Because when you think of professor, professor someone, you know, gray hair and, and, and uh, beard and, and no, I old think school it's, uh, people. It's, you were only 30-something uh, when you became professor. No, actually, I was 40. 40. Yeah. 30, 40. <laughs> you were 40. No, it's... 39 uh, plus. Yeah. No, I think it's, it's, a, it's a, some hard work, mm -hmm. very little talent, actually, uh, and, uh, and, a, and a combination of luck and strategic choice of a field. So, because if you want to 
to make an interesting career for yourself. You shouldn't do what others do. That's, mm. For me, this is very important. If you, if you start to going mainstream, uh, then immediately you will have hurdles in your career because mm. you will come into a very crowded field. Some people say this is good, this is competition, it brings out the best, but I promise you also in quite new fields, open fields, mm. there is competition of course. Mm. But there's also, you also have to take a, a lot of responsibility very early. Mm. Uh, and uh, that can I, and some people hate that those that are the ones that typically go mainstream I would think what we call strebers in Swedish yeah. <laughs> and uh, then but my, to find an unexplored area where mm. there's a lot of space to move and build things up this mm. is what I like mm. and, and on your yeah on your door you have a, a, 10 advices from CA so. exactly I have the mosque what is called the Moscow rules on my yeah. door and uh, that is because I, it actually teaches me that I have them there to remind me that not to get too obsessed with, with what it could, could be called institutional politics or faculty politics. Because mm. there is, and when you work in a huge governmental organization like ours, then there, there is always some internal politics mm. and there is some gossip and there are some intrigues. Not very much. I think my environment is unusually free of those. But uh, this is a reminder that they ever, ever, not ever suspend uh, much energy on this. And how uh, do you succeed as a scientist? How do you, how do you push it to, to the Nobel Prize level? I, that, I, I'm not sure I will ever push not, it to that not, level. Not you, but what you but think? when we think we, we do high quality things which match the patients, it's, I think it's uh, plan it well and then uh, stay, in line, stay on target. Mm. Uh, I, as, as a younger researcher, I, I often drifted away in different directions. I got ni- new ideas, too yeah. many ideas, too little yeah. time. And uh, I made fuzzy work, uh, I would call it. Is there any lessons we can draw from, from the CA? Because you read a lot about different intelligence agencies around the world. Yeah, it's, it's one of my passionate. hobbies, actually. Yeah. What, I call, what is called the history of, uh, history of uh, in, in national intelligence. Yeah. yeah. Is there any parallels? Tell me about them. But the, para, the, the spy, spying organizations and pathology have a lot in common because they are both parts of large organizations and they are the hub of information. Mm. So if you would say, if you make a, if we say that the U.S. Army, they are like, like the surgeons maybe in the U.S. Department of State, that's mm. the oncologists. And they both need information to do their job. Mm. And to, to do that, they would, trust the intelligence agencies to do that and they and the intelligence get the right information by combining several different sources and this is what we do in modern pathology so old pathology is just looking at slides in the microscope mm. this is kind of still what the classical thing this is still the, the backbone the vertebra of pathology is yeah. doing that but now we get information from for instance from looking at the genomes of cancers yeah it's more like signals intelligence as they would call it in the, in the in the intelligence business and then, of course, you also take into account much more now with computerized filing systems, documentation systems. You can also look through the entire patient's history mm. and get much more data. This is like the human intelligence, or human. Mm. And then we have the classical things with just looking at images. Which is, it's a bit like what they, they call geospa- geospatial intelligence, satellite images, and so on. And do you think, you know, the, the, what will the future bring? You have artificial intelligence, you yeah. have virtual reality. Mm. Mm. There's a lot of new tools yeah. being developed. Mm. What do you think will happen with these? They will change. They, they will transform how our everyday work is being done, clearly. Mm. Uh, we, I work in a very information-heavy environment, and both in the sense that we need better and better and stronger and stronger computational powers Still, our projects are slower than they have to be because we have to wait for slots on, super, on national supercomputers. Yeah. So higher computing capabilities with better microprocessors will, of course, make everything a lot faster. So, yeah. I mean, just in a few years, I'm quite convinced that you can, even within a kind of rather ordinary healthcare system, you can take a sample from a patient's cancer, for instance, mm. and just one or two days later, you will, be make sh- you will know exactly which are the important mutated genes in this cancer, and then you can design drugs to target those in yeah. another, maybe that might take another 10 years. Uh, but the information will be there early on, and it will be much faster than today's when this is something which 
because the system is not rigged for it yet. It takes weeks. Uh. Uh, so that's one thing. And also how we work in our daily life when we work with images, for instance. Medical images like radiology or my field in pathology. Uh, I think we will step into virtual worlds. Mm. Well, those of us who likes to do that and try new techniques, mm. we will have that capability and that will make us uh, see details that we don't see today. And today you find you know, new papers all around on mm. this brings cancer, this stops cancer, mm. this, like coffee, you have mm. sp split reports from each and every corner. Mm. How do we live in order to not get cancer? Mm. There is no... Uh, since we are, we are all different individuals, and uh, one th if you want to live not to get cancer, you should die young. <laughs> it's the only way, safe yeah. way, yeah. to lay down and die as soon yeah. as you pro possibly can. So you do like Kurt Cobain yeah. and uh, exactly. Janis Joplin yeah. and Jimi yeah. Hendrix and exactly. uh, Amy Winehouse. and uh, exactly. 27 is a good uh, age then to take it away. Yeah. Do, do you have any other advice? Besides that, no. Use common sense. I mean, smoking is uh, very, very is, is not good. Too much alcohol is not good. Try to eat a variety of foods. That's. Then there are details, mm. uh, of course. If you you can modify your risk in various ways, and there's advice from various sources, usually with commercial interest, what you should eat and how much you should eat. So, for being very obese is also is also dangerous, of course. Maybe for cancer, but definitely for, for cardiac disease mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and your blood pressure. So, but try to use it. But all those things are fairly obvious if you just use, use your common sense. So just trust your common sense. Don't listen too much to media reports or alarm reports. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, if you hear something repeatedly over many, many years, then mm -hmm. it's probably true. It's like smoking. I mean, we, yeah. we know that this is not good. Because when my father grew up, they didn't know it was no. dangerous. No. But today... Yeah, they do. So yeah. it's it's the information change over time. Yeah, and you think that it's m more uh, dangerous to to be depressed and have a negative mindset than to eat a bag of chips and. and uh, now we're talking about yeah po yeah. I, it depends on if you look at those bag of chips uh, once every year, it wouldn't matter. If you do it on a daily basis, it probably would, would become fat, and that is not good uh, uh. <laughs> for your overall lifestyle. Uh, and uh, for for your risk of cardiovascular disease and uh, also for cancer, so uh, not too much of it. Any any excesses are probably not good when no. it comes to. But when it comes to these small dietary factors that people recommend, uh, wine, a glass of wine per day, or if you shouldn't, if you should take vitamin supplements, for instance, then I would bet that uh, because we don't know. Uh, then mm. Because we don't know, I would bet that uh, having a, a right mindset, not being too depressed or trying to, to have a positive attitude might actually keep you alive longer than those dietary advice. Yeah. Uh, because for that, we don't, no one has really looked at that. No. Uh, so there's very little data. Yeah. Therefore, I could make an educated guess. Yeah. But with, with the different kind of very detailed habits uh, when it comes to eating, mm. we, we know that. It has been explored usually many times, and mm. the effects are very small. And you have these blue zones around the world. You have Okinawa and Sardinia and, mm. and the, the Icarus Island in Greece. Costa Rica, there's a little village. Mm. And in Santa Barbara and USA, there's a little village. There have these five blue zones. Mm. There's less cancer. They live longer to be 100 mm. years old. There's a significant a lot of people being old there. So. And then, you know, a person like me think that if you just import their cookbook here mm. and you eat fish and you eat vegetables and you drink the Sardinian uh, vine and so on, you, you will live a long and healthy life. Mm. But you didn't have that... Uh, no, you, have to be, you probably have to become them. Yeah. In many different... And it's very difficult to become another population of humanity. Yeah. Just like that, because so, what so they eat and the, the every, it's all environment and your genes and how your genes are programmed mm. to be expressed, they all go hand in hand mm. and are subjected to evolution over time. So mm. you can't just take one thing. Usually, you can, I shouldn't say never, because there is never ne anything, any such thing as never in biology. Mm. But usually, you can't just pick up one or two things from a certain spot there where people mm. live for very long and, 
and think that this is it. This, mm. this will make me live as long as that. And, and, but you know, you hear all around that refined sugar is bad for you, mm. and vegetables and anti antioxidants mm. are, are, mm. are good for you. And then, yeah. then, then it just came out a new research report from Saul Grenska, mm. where he says that the very thing that you know should stop cancer and, and protect the cells mm. were also increasing the cancer cells. Mm. Yeah. Tell me about this new report. No, it's just. Uh, it, this is not my field at all, no. actually. Uh, but uh, of I course, trust you and everything. So and I just, uh, no. <laughs> antioxidants, of course. I mean, first of all, there is no support that eating antioxidants keep you can keep you away mm. extensively from cancer. It, that this is not the case. It doesn't seem to matter very much. There are even studies from the UK saying that if you eat vitamin supplements, you live shorter. Mm. And of course, from a biological point of view, this, the, what the, the Solgaska study it makes a lot of sense because the, the, if there are any cells in your body that are really stressed and would need to buffer up their free radicals, those are the cancer cells because they are under tremendous metabolic stress because they grow much more than the entire system is rigged to do. There is no, the body doesn't have a plan to provide a tumor with blood vessels, for instance. The tumor cells themselves have to find out a way. Mm through evolution, mm. and evolution costs a lot of cell lives, so you kill off a lot of cells by just getting a cell population in the end that is able to recruit blood vessels, yeah. and so on. So all those things, metabolic stress, lack of oxygen and nutrients, that builds up a lot of, of free radicals in the tumor. Oh. So from a theoretical standpoint, it makes a lot of sense that uh, you can help the cancer cells by, give, by eating antioxidants. Mm. So, David, five rapid-fire questions. What does love mean to you and, and in your life? Everything. Mm. I mean, otherwise, this is to be human. Mm. It's the very essence. It is, yeah. Mm. Success. What does that mean to you? And so, just to... I, for me, I would... Uh, Associated immediately to the word uh, ra occasional. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but there are small things, and I don't, I don't think very much about success actually. Mm. It's. Um, it's perhaps then you achieve it, and you don't think about it too much. Yeah. Maybe it's uh, it it. You want it, staying on focus is important, uh. Uh, and uh, of yes, and of course when, when you pass a milestone in a certain product that you have. Uh, that can be called success, and it, it's, of course it's associated with a, a lot of pleasure. Mm. Uh, but it's, success depends on so much. It's, uh, it's, uh, some, so it's uh, really uh, ga the game of life is full of successes and failures. Mm. And this is, I, think, I personally think uh, that this is so much more up to, to things we cannot control mm. than we would like to think. We think we can control a lot more mm. than we can control. Uh, a lot is just actually, I think, uh, handled from somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> you could call it God, you could call it nature. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the nature of the gods. Yeah, exactly. Motivation. What does it mean to you and how do you, how do you achieve it? Uh, from, I think for most people with high motivation, they are born like that. They're just target-oriented, highly motivated people. And other people don't have that drive. Uh, actually, I think that is... That you, you can, so that, that is one answer. If you want to talk about po personalities that are, show continuous motivation, so who get very far, like mm. elite athletes that I know you have met, mm. several of them. I think they're, to be honest, I think they're born like that. But then it comes to other things, like how do you motivate a group of people to work in a common direction? Mm. And that's a different business. Mm. This was what we would call morale. Mm. Um, and that is about, for me, this is a lot about, as a leader, showing up, being on site, and particularly about education. Mm. So, to explain, it's, I, so I, when I work with in the healthcare system, for me, in the teams I work, it's extremely important that everyone knows why we do something. Mm. What makes a great leader then? Many things. 
<laughs> uh, and there are different styles. Mm. Uh, it's someone who, in a way that fits the personality, man manages to lead pay or no, to uh, make people walk in the same direction, basically. But how you do that is very, there are so many different styles. I'm an educational leader. Mm. This is my style. Mm -hmm. I try to make people to on their own actually walk in in a voluntary way, walk in the same way as I do because they share my reasons for it. Yeah. And this, I mean, in large organizations, again, this is often forgotten mm. that actually everyone from the lowest pay grade to the highest pay grade, they have to know why something is being done. And, and that, because this makes everyone feel important and mm. everyone is important. If they're not important, they shouldn't be on the team. Mm. So if they're on the team, they're important and they should know it. And what's the similarities between you know, business life, tech startups, mm. and university life here. Now, in, in countries like Sweden and the US, where everything is based on, almost everything is based on external funding, it's the same, I would say. Mm. About the same level of bureaucracy, mm. same level of free riding, and so on. It's a bit more control here, I think, because you still have all the rigorous standards of experimental research. So mm. you couldn't kind of come up with a research plan, which is a super, it cannot be, completely outrageous mm. uh, but sometimes we ha I mean we have a lot of startups here in Lund mm. it's, it's a highly educated city loads of startups and sometimes when you get in when you work with them and get in contact with them and you read their business plans you for, for me it's amazing that people would invest in it <laughs> because yeah. it's it, the, the experimental evidence that the plan would ever work is, mm. is uh, either it's completely counterintuitive or there is very little data. Yeah. And so, <laughs> so I think there is, we, are a, we have to be slightly more convincing mm. than uh, tech startups mm. in a, in a money-rich environment. Of course, if you're in a poor environment, then you probably have to have, you already have to be selling things mm. <laughs> to get the investments. Mm. Yeah. What do you fear, David? Do you have any fears in life? Yeah, oh yeah, sure. Um, that my loved ones will fall ill, for instance. That is uh, something that I think everyone fears, unless I have a very strange... Do you see more or less brain. sicknesses when you're a doctor? But you, you said... You know, I say less, actually. You take, your, you you take your kids less. to, to, uh, no, to school if, if they're not too, too sick. Uh, yeah, here is where the, yeah exactly. No, it's uh, doctors are known to be ha kind of ki quite tough parents in that sense. Yeah, uh, but I, I have I have friends who are doctors who are just the opposite. So I'm I'm quite since I work with kids who are really sick. Yeah. My standard for being being sick yeah. is very. I have a very high threshold. Yeah. Um, but uh, I know other parents who are doctors who have a very low threshold and worry. I very, I worry since I know that kids my kids age. They're in, in the, the preschoolers. They usually, in Sweden, they, don't, they are usually live a superb life and they, are not, they don't get any serious illness. Mm. So I'm generally very unworried mm. about them. Mm. And uh, happiness. When, you are, when, when are you the most happy in your life and in, and in your work life? In situations where I was surprised by something, uh, something positive that I did not expect. Mm. So th th it's good because it means I can kind of never rig the system to be to promote any happiness. So yeah. it never becomes boring. Yeah. So happiness is always something which kind of tumbles down from the skies in an yeah. unexpected way. Yeah. Like a rain of joy. Yeah. And I wasn't surprised that it was a great day for me in your in your it was a pleasure having research you lab yeah. and warm thank you for your generosity and yeah. your good advice and and uh, all the best to you in your research in the future in the years to come so all the best to you and to your audience thanks yeah. a lot thanks a lot take care